All right, so let's start at the beginning. We are in a six-part series on the foundations of our faith. Now, why would we spend six weeks talking about God, man, Christ, and this week's topic, redemption, and the following two weeks, the church, and then the end times? Because everything that we talk about in the Bible and in application finds its roots in one of these things that we're talking about. Everything in the Bible, everything that we apply, finds it, the roots are here in these foundations. We got to keep building on a solid foundation to continue growing in our walk with the Lord. Now we're halfway through the series. The sermons on God, man, and last week Christ were preached to show us the people at the ends, opposite ends of the spectrum. God, man, and Christ in between, bridging that gap for us. This week, we talk about what Jesus did to make that connection between us and God possible. A quick recap of the first three foundation stones. Part one was the doctrine of God, and we talked about his holy love. The fact that he is separate from us, and yet intimately intertwined in our lives. Part two was the doctrine of man, and we Know that we're built in God's image. We are centrally related to, dependent on, and responsible to Him, our Maker. And then part three was the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Remember, He was fully man and fully God. We had that term called kenosis. You remember what kenosis meant? The emptying out of. And Ralph, your favorite term last week, hypostatic union. Hypostatic union. Anybody remember what that was? It's that, that tension of being fully man and fully God at the same time. And that was affirmed and has been affirmed and accepted for hundreds and hundreds of years. We're never alone because he experienced everything that we did. Which brings us to the, today's topic of redemption. It's an interesting word, redemption. Dictionary.com defines it in six different yet similar ways. It's to buy or pay off, clear by payment, to buy back as after a tax sale or a mortgage foreclosure, to recover something pledged or mortgaged by payment or other satisfaction, to exchange for money or goods, to convert into specie, paper money, to discharge or fulfill a pledge, a promise. And there's a seventh one, to make up for, to make amends for, to offset some type of fault or shortcoming. That last one's pretty interesting, isn't it? To make up for, to make amends for, to offset some type of a shortcoming. That's what redemption means. All redemption requires payment of some sort, right? There's a cost, right, for redeeming something. Think about the soda bottle manufacturer. He wants to redeem the bottle so he can fill it with good stuff again. So he pays you to give him the container, the empty container. What was good has now gone out of that container. But there was good in it before, right? Any of you Coca-Cola folks know this? Gatorade? All right, maybe some mellow yellow people here. I don't know, but there was something good in there that you enjoyed, and that good is gone now. Before, the good stuff was sucked out of it. That's what happened, right? And now the manufacturer says, okay, I want the bottle back. To get it back, he has to do something. He pays for it. Anybody ever turn stuff in? Right? You turn stuff in and he pays for it. The bottle manufacturer in the end. Somebody's got to redeem it or the bottle stays empty, filthy, dirty among the most vile of trash. But then the vessel is redeemed. It gets cleansed. Not just cleaned, but sterilized. And it gets refilled with good stuff again. It's a neat picture, isn't it? What's the opposite of to redeem something? 
It's to abandon it, to leave unwanted, to ignore, to discard all lonely and horrible mental images when we consider ourselves as one of the bottles, aren't they? If I'm discarded, abandoned, left alone for eternity, it's a bad thing. So let's get back to the good side of the equation. The wanted, cleaned, refilled part. That's redemption. Now wait a second. I know what salvation is. It's being saved. I thought salvation was admitting sin, praying a prayer, and it's finished. I'm free. It's a free gift that I can't earn. Right? Isn't that salvation? Yeah. So, you know, it was interesting. I I asked my son, Jacob. I said, hey, Pally. I'm preaching a message on redemption. I said, let me ask you a question. If I asked you to describe for me the difference between salvation and redemption, sanctification, justification, any of those things, what would you say? There was a long pause, and I said, you don't need to say anything. I said, because that's exactly the point, is that sometimes we get a little fuzzy on the whole idea between salvation and redemption, don't we? And you don't have to answer. You don't have to shake your head. Yeah. You know what? It happens to everybody. So my goal today is for us to just kind of draw some clear lines and say, that's salvation. That's redemption. I'm going to try to understand what that is. Now, why do I want you to understand that? Well, we'll get there in just a minute. Anybody like me and said, so what's the difference? Again, salvation and redemption. Maybe you haven't thought about it too deeply. Hey, they're both good and part of that getting saved thing. I'm with you. They are both a good thing. And they're both part of that getting saved thing. But if we're going to handle the word of God rightly, and part of that is understanding what it is we're talking about, we need to know what redemption is. We need to understand that salvation is done, redemption is the payment. See, in the Old Testament, the sacrificial system made clear the price to be paid for sin committed by Israel. It was blood through death of animals. Redemption cost, animal sacrifice. But what about under the New Covenant? What is the redemption cost there? What does it cost to redeem a human life? Hmm, interesting question, huh? Let's look at this, not to become biblical scholars, but to build our knowledge of theology, the study of God, Christology specifically, in order to understand what we believe and why we believe it. The whole point is to know how special the work of Jesus was and what he did for us, to appreciate it for its unique nature, to see it for the beauty that it is. Because redemption potentially is one of the most beautiful things you've ever not thought about before in your life. What? What is that heretic preaching in a Yankee jersey saying about me not thinking about redemption? And it's so important? I'm a Baptist. Of course I've thought about this. No, we haven't. I'm a Baptist too. And no, we haven't. How many people here have been stung by a bee? Oh, yeah, okay. Wow, welcome to Virginia. Okay, I see what is in my future. Okay, okay, fantastic. (laughs) Well, you know what? If you've been stung by a bee, you know that it hurts, and you don't like it, and you can't stand it, and you want to kill that stupid bee. Until you've watched a Discovery Channel episode on bees and you understand how complex a social structure they come from and how important they are in our uh, ecosystem, you look at them not with terror in your eye necessarily as they're going to sting you, but you have a tendency to wonder about how incredible they are. Changes your perspective just a little bit. Some people looking at that slide going, "Uh, no, didn't change my perspective at all.
Salvation requires a savior. That's Jesus. He saved us from a life separated from him, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. How he did it is where redemption comes in. Remember? God here, man here, Jesus in between. He saved us from being separate, but he had to do something to make that happen. E.F. Harrison in the Baker Evangelical Dictionary says this. Listen carefully. No word in the Christian vocabulary deserves to be held more precious than Redeemer. For even more than Savior, it reminds the child of God that his salvation has been purchased at a great personal cost. For the Lord has given himself for our sins in order to deliver us from them. Christ the Redeemer. Christ the Redeemer is the top of the chain. Now, why do you say that even more than Savior? Well, he saved us, but at a cost, a price. The manufacturer pays a price to get his bottle back. He is, in fact, paying it back to himself, Jesus is. But it fulfills the payment required to settle the accounts of a perfectly righteous God who must have reconciled accounts. Jane Grant He'd pass any audit, accounts level, paperwork in order, everything, would he not? Yeah. All authority perfectly administered. Can I get an amen? Yeah. God is holy and righteous. His holy love. Everything is perfect. So if there is something on the debit side of the ledger, there needs to be something on the credit side. It costs something. You cost something. So what price does Jesus pay? He buys us out of slavery into freedom with the sacrifice of blood. He pays the ransom for our lives from slavery to sin into freedom in him. His sacrifice atones for and pays for our sin. He takes our place. He pays the price to get the bottle back that we owe. Any Tom Cruise fans here? Tom Cruise fan? Hey, at least from Top Gun, right? You're a Tom Cruise fan. Somebody's got to be a Tom Cruise fan. Okay, yeah, I don't like his Scientology thing, but I'll tell you what, in Top Gun, he was good. He's good in a few other flicks, right? Well, author Bryson Smith in the Sydney Morning Herald tells this story, and I want to read it to you, and I want you to key in because this could be you. It says, I once read an interesting article all about movie stand ins, says Bryson Smith. They're the people who replace movie stars in scenes that are dangerous or just uncomfortable. Like Glenn Duhigg, an ex-lawyer who worked as the stand-in for Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible 2. How cool would that be, huh? Yes, I'm Tom Cruise's stand-in. That's right. As Duhigg himself recalls, it sounds very glamorous saying you're the stand-in for Tom Cruise, but I don't think many people realize the long hours and constant demands that deflate your ego very quickly. The days are long. Whatever scene Tom was in, I would be the one standing there, being him. And sometimes, for ages, as the crew set up the shot, getting the lighting just right and the props just so, I'd be standing there for hours and hours in the weather, getting drenched in the rain or sunstroke out in the heat. And then Tom would just walk out of the set from his air-conditioned caravan or out of his beautiful sports car once the scene was ready. As one of the other stand-ins said, I realized very quickly the difference between being a star and being a stand-in. Who are we in that story? We're Tom Cruise. We're Tom Cruise. We get to just stroll on in. Somebody else has done all the work. You see, Jesus does all the work. He endures all the sunstroke, the lashes of the whip. Whoa, are these on? The nails in his hands and feet, and we, well, we get to walk into the shot when it's being done for real. We're the ones that'll be judged, but only in the light of Jesus, with his righteousness. We look good, really good. That's the price he pays for redeeming us. So he saves us, but in saving us, he has to pay the price of redemption. 
Can you see why he's revered so much as Christ the Redeemer? Hey, Savior is, that's a big thing. But the Redeemer pays the price. This is where the rubber meets the road. Let's look at Romans 3, verses 21 through 26. Romans, if you go past the Gospels, you get to Acts, and then what do you get to? Romans. So Romans is a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Rome before he had ever been there. Romans is known as the Reader's Digest of the New Testament. Why? Because it, it covers so much theology. And it packs it all into one book called Romans. If you could read one book other than a gospel, I would recommend, if you're going to read nothing else, you read Romans. It's a, it's a, it's a heavy read, but it's really fantastic. So Romans 3, picking up in verse 21. Now, I'm reading from the New American Standard. You might have either an English Standard Version or an NIV, which is okay. <clears throat> but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. That's the Old Testament part right there. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is not one of us that is righteous, folks. No, not one. Verse 24, being justified is a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Okay, let's go back just a second. Do you remember I've told you before what propitiation is? That's a big word, propitiation. Do you remember what that is? That's that double imputation, the exchange. Jesus gets all of our sin. We get all of his righteousness. Remember, this is the win-win scenario for us. Seems like it's lose-lose for Jesus, right? It's not because of that. Ralph, what was that word again, that, that phrase? hypostatic union right that's what you meant to say right there yeah because of the hypostatic union because he was perfectly man and perfectly God at the same time verse 24 being justified is a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus Jesus was our redemption he was the payment he got the bottle back he paid the price so we could be filled again with something good because in the garden, we let something good spill out. We chose to let it just fall over and all over the ground. Let's look at Hebrews 2. So if you go to the right in your Bible, go all the way, keep going through Corinthians. And God eats popcorn, you guys know what that is. And pastoral epistles. And right after Philemon, you come upon Hebrews. Hebrews 2, verse 14. Verse 14. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, so that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. So as Jesus dies... He gains power over the devil. Why? Because on the third day he rose again. You bet. Verse 15, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. That's you and me. For assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things. He had to be made like you. He was fully man so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God 
to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Jesus was perfectly man and perfectly God. And here he is the propitiation, the payment, the redemption for you. And to say that, well, I feel far from God. Jesus doesn't really understand where I am. Well, I'm, I'm really in a really tough spot. And I, gosh, nobody understands me. And nobody can really get me. I, I feel so bummed out. Nobody can relate to me. God wouldn't even want to look at me the way I am. But those are all lies born from the pit of hell. That's Satan trying to drive a wedge in between you and the one who redeemed you. Did we take ourselves off of the bottle heap? No, no. In Eden, we chose not to. Today, we choose not to more often than not. We choose to stay on the bottle heap. But God loves us so much, he helps us when we can't help ourselves. Listen to this short bit in 1 John 4. It says, in this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, the payment of, the swapping out of sin for righteousness. Matthew 20 makes it clear that Jesus came to redeem, to pay the ransom for us. Here he's straightening out the disciples who are arguing about who's going to sit on Jesus' right hand. Okay, that's the setup. And here it is, verse 26. It says, It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Listen carefully. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Who are you? Many. That's why he came. Not to be great, to serve you. What about 1 Timothy 2? Verse 5, it says, For there's one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. Now, now is the proper time. Now is when we need to shout praise about being freed from a life of sin, to be able to choose the light and not cower in the dark. Now is the time to share that good news with the people in our lives that need to hear that they're worth the price of a life. Now is the time. Are you willing to be as excited as God was excited to pay the price for you? You're saved by Jesus, redeemed by his sacrifice. Are we clear about that? Does he deserve an amen? Yeah, he does. Yeah, I agree with that. That's what amen means. Yeah, I agree. Jesus is God. Yeah, Jesus is man. Jesus died for my sins. Jesus paid the price for me. Amen to all of that. I read a story of a little boy who built a sailboat. He built the sail. He had it all fixed up. He had it tarred and painted. He took it to the lake and pushed it in, hoping it would sail. Sure enough, a wisp of breeze filled the little sail, and it billowed and went rippling along the waves. Can you see it? Suddenly, before the little boy knew it, the boat was out of his reach. Even though he waded in fast and tried to grab it, As he watched it float away, he hoped maybe the breeze would shift and it would come sailing back to him. Instead, he watched it go further and further until it was gone. When he went home crying, his mother asked, what's wrong? Didn't it work? And he said it worked too well. Sometime later, the little boy was downtown and walked past a second-hand store. There in the window, he saw the boat. It was unmistakably his. So he went in and said to the proprietor, hey, that's my boat. He walked up to the window, picked it up, and started to leave with it. 
The owner of the shop said, wait a minute, Sonny, that's my boat. I bought it from someone. The boy said, no, it's my boat. I made it, see? And he showed him the little scratches and the marks where he hammered and filed. The man said, I'm sorry, Sonny. If you want it, you have to buy it. The poor little guy didn't have any money. But he worked hard and he saved his pennies. Finally, one day, he had enough money. He went in and he bought the little boat. As he left the store, holding the boat close to him, he was heard saying, you're my boat. You're twice my boat. First, you're my boat because I made you. And second, you're my boat because I bought you. If you ever think that you aren't worth much, if you think you're cheap, if you think you're worthless, if you've had those times in your life when you said, why would anybody love me? Why would anybody understand me? Why would anybody care that deeply for me? Remember what God thinks of you. He thinks you're his. Twice his. First, you're his because he made you, and second, you're his because he bought you on the cross. He paid a price to redeem you. So let go of your stress to God's care. Let go of your sins to God's cross. Celebrate the fact that you are paid for and you are his. Salvation, yes. Redemption, yes, times two. Would you bow your heads? Lord God, these truths are evident. We, we acknowledge them, we affirm them, and we have no answer. We have no answer for them other than surrendering ourselves to you on a regular basis, acknowledging that you are the Christ, that you are the one who loves us and cares for us and paid for us because you value us that much. We celebrate that now as the musicians come back to the stage and we enter into our time of invitation. Lord, we give this time up to you. It's in Jesus. Amen.